Now, I'm delighted to say that we are joined by absolute broadcasting royalty on the Irish <laughs> F1 show. Lee McKenzie, you're very welcome. Delighted to be oh, talking Thank to you. you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. As we record, it's a very big day for you. The launch of your book, Inside F1, is out. So um, how are we feeling? A little nervous, I must admit. It's times like this I wish I just drank or baked sourdough like the rest of Great Britain during lockdown. But for some reason, I decided to do some writing. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, it has been a long time coming. So, yeah, I, I just hope the reaction's good. So when did the first, I suppose, inkling of an idea come about to, to take on this project? And I suppose, was, was COVID a big help in, in giving you the time to go ahead and do it? Well, actually, a lot, most of it's been written really in the last 12 months, to be perfectly honest. Um, I had written the Lewis Hamilton chapter or an article uh, during lockdown 2020. Um, I'd been asked to do it for a magazine. And then once I'd finished it, I thought, I wonder if this could be something a bit bigger, because I'm known for doing these sort of big interviews with drivers over the years, um, some fun, some controversial. Um, things that don't really happen anymore. You know, you would go away from the track. You know, I went to Venezuela, I've been to Mexico. Uh, I've been all over the world just to do maybe a couple of filming days with drivers and, and they just don't have the time now, especially as the calendar gets you know longer and longer. Um, so yeah, I've been part of it when it was like that. Really bizarre experiences like taking a horse from Michael Schum from the UK over to Michael Schumacher's to compete in an equestrian competition with them, and I thought, yeah, maybe this, maybe there's something in this. And then I spoke to a few publishers, and and they were keen. So, um, but the, the book was never to be about me. I was uh, very sort of definite about that because people were like, well, do it all about you and you know, and your story in Formula One and other sports. And I thought, well, A, it'll be dull, and B, I'm not really that kind of person. And the whole thing about Formula One is how, you know, you don't know enough about the drivers. They are much more exciting, personable, human than they come across. Um, and I wanted to try and give that side to it. Mm -hmm. I suppose from a broadcasting point of view and having the experience, uh, not to the extent of yourself, but it is really a game a lot of the time. So the people that we see, the interviews we see, you know, the drivers, regardless of what sports person it is, they're so well versed anyway. And then as soon as the microphone goes off, of course, you always get truth. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, some people probably don't get that realization, I think, at times. Yeah, I, I get that. And it still happens to me. You know, I was uh, presenting, where was it? I think it was Azerbaijan, the Grand Prix there. And, you know, did all the interviews afterwards and you think you've done a good job. And then we all got on the same plane to fly back to the UK. And once all the team bosses and everyone's sitting around with a, you know, a gin and tonic in hand or something, then they actually tell you the truth about what did happen. And I'm like, well, what use is this to me now? Um, but since I had a gin and tonic in hand as well, I was probably much more honest too. So you do share these experiences afterwards, but of course it's the same in any sport. You know, I've presented um, all the Ireland rugby internationals for the last five years. Um, and it's the same, if you put a, a mic in front of any sportsman, rugby player, tennis player, F1 driver, whoever, they're not really going to give you the 100% truth in that moment. It's very unusual that when that happens. It's fantastic when that happens, um, but it tends to come from a place of anger as a, instead of a place of positivity. Yeah. Um, obviously, you have Michael Schumacher featured in the book, Lewis Hamilton, Sebastian Vettel, Max Verstappen, Fernando Alonso, Felipe Massa, Jensen Button, it is a, a stellar cast. But a question I wanted to ask was, and it doesn't have to be out of these seven in particular, but who, in your opinion, is the best actor in terms of doing the piece, masking reality, and then afterwards just completely different? I think probably Fernando, and I can say this because he would probably agree, I'm sure. I mean, it's in it's in the book, but um that whole thing when he'd lost the drive at Ferrari, Sebastian Vettel was coming in. Fernando just denied everything. He just said it was on his terms. He said that, you know, he's in a position where he can pick and choose teams. And he is in a position where he could pick or choose teams, but that was not on his terms. He did not expect that. And I did, a, we all listened to so many interviews the next day. And you, you're in a dangerous position. You're going down that sort of politics route. If you're sort of telling someone they're a barefaced liar to their face. You'd rather not do that. Um, but it was just it's just surreal to hear that. Sometimes you're thinking, 
okay, this is an interesting take. Um, but he, for, I think Fernando was the master of that. Again, it's not malice. It's just he controls the rhetoric around him so well. Mm -hmm. I think in fairness, you've touched upon it in the book that an interview has never prevented you from having a very good personal relationship with some of the drivers and indeed team bosses. And in actual fact, you've mm -hmm. stated that you've attended their weddings. So that's obviously something that you're particularly, I suppose, proud of in one sense. But at the same time, you you shouldn't really expect anything else because I think the drivers are aware you have, to, you have a job to do and, and vice versa. Yeah, and, and we all are playing the same game um, to a certain extent. I mean, I think that the respect I get, hopefully, from team bosses and drivers is because I've been there for a while, but also um, I do my research and I work really hard and then I tend to ask uh, questions that have a little bit of... Um, humanity about it it's not just quick fire you know I kind of understand the bigger picture and what they'll be going through um, I'm not just there to sort of grab headlines so therefore they do open up to me quite a lot I mean Mark Webber says I think it's on the back of the book that uh, a lot of the drivers say things to me that they just shouldn't say out loud uh, and they don't realize until they've done it and I think in many ways that that is a compliment and, and hopefully it's because of respect and trust yeah and time and building up those relationships as well because that's probably the yeah. single greatest difficulty when entering that industry is just building those relationships building that trust and it can be frustrating in the early stages can't it yeah absolutely and again that goes on um on any sport you know i appear now as uh, at wimbledon on center court and court one as soon as a match is over you know i sort of like strut on always in flat shoes i got into trouble for wearing heels and ruining the grass a couple of years ago so now it's trainers only and i walk out and i do the interview with the with the winner and more often than not i won't have spoken to them before and that's a really strange thing to try and sort of get a trustworthy interview in that moment uh, i don't have that problem in formula one i've tend to have seen the drivers coming up through the ranks through f3 f2 um, it used to be GP3, GP2. You know, I worked my way up exactly the same as the drivers have done. Uh, so there's no difference from me. And I think that they appreciate that. They understand that. You know, I love motorsport, not just Formula One. Um, I've co-driven in rallies. Um, I've covered American motor racing. I go to Le Mans. I actually just generally love it. Um, and I think there's an appreciation uh, from the drivers because of that. You know, they see me presenting Goodwood Revival. They see me presenting Goodwood and knowing all the older F1 drivers and the new ones coming through as well. And I think that certainly helps. A uh, couple of class wins in your rallying career as well. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Uh, actually, I was speaking to the jockey, Danny Mullins, um, about this recently because he's just taken part in a rally for the first time. He lives time. literally he five or ten minutes away. Does he? Yeah, well, I he's interviewed got him a few weeks ago too. He did a rally down in Wexford um, when yeah, he did the Irish right. Rally podcast and oh, he was great fun. It was for a great cause as well. Great character. Yeah, it, a great cause. And, um, you know, it's it's exciting to see. When I saw that he was doing it, because I know him from like horse racing and stuff, I couldn't believe that he was doing it. And we actually, I sent him pictures of me like co-driving and like we went over a jump too high smashed the sump out all the rest of it but yeah i absolutely love it i actually got my um co-driving license back i'm not entirely sure why but i uh i reapplied this year so i've got my license back so whether i do a rally in the co-driving seat again i'm not entirely sure but it's I, I'm, I'm organized i'm ready if anyone needs me yeah and how about popping across into the driver's seat no i you know your limits i know my limits that is for sure you've got to have i mean people might or might not know but you do have to be able to drive to be a co-driver because if suddenly your driver takes ill or something like that you've got to slot into the seat of course you're not going to suddenly go mad i've driven single seaters and i've driven around racetracks and things before i actually last year drove the safety car around silverstone um which yeah that was shambolic actually and i didn't that was the other thing they had onboard cameras i did not stop talking at one point i didn't even have my hands on the wheel i'm not entirely sure what i was thinking but yeah i will not be a, a rally driver or any driver of any sort i don't think just on i've the got way too much enthusiasm than talent that applies to most <laughs> things in my life <laughs> just on, on the topic of silverstone we've got to touch upon your dad's story right how did oh. this mad mad bet come about with mark weber and how horrific was that for you it time? was horrific so for those people who don't know um, mclaren were having a really difficult year and my dad was on uh, radio five live with mark weber and just said look mclaren are so bad they're not going to win a race this year and mark who was driving still at the time was like well what would you do mate and dad was like well i, I don't know 
do anything really mark was like okay would you run around silverstone naked and i was like yeah if mclaren win a race this year i will run around silverstone naked they're so bad it won't happen next race <laughs> the very next race at spa mclaren won and it was just it was outrageous and i was trying to get into formula one so i was presenting gp2 at the time and uh the stories were ridiculous dad was going to buy a dog, call it naked, and then run it round Silverstone. And then it was going to hire Silverstone. At one point, it was going to hire Silverstone on Christmas Day because it was going to be cheaper. I was like, not a chance. Anyway, um, he knew he was in trouble when Max Mosley and the FIA at the time gave him £10,000 towards uh, Tommy's baby charity, which is a, a charity very close to, at the time, Ron Dennis's heart. Um, so I just knew. So I was presenting the support races with a, an eye on getting into Formula One. And my father was body painted silver to, he didn't look like a McLaren. Uh, and I got a t-shirt <laughs> made up. So it's just said that, oh my God, father. And then the charity on the back, just in case anyone thought he was a complete weirdo, which he obviously was. But he'd, he'd done a deal with David Cothard to stop because it was a really hot day. He thought he was like, going to die or something running around the track. So the driver's parade was meant to stop and pick up my dad and dad would like, you know, just do a lap. Um, but Bernie Eccleston found out about it and set the driver's parade off 15 minutes early, which just what doesn't happen now because it's covered on television all over the world, the driver's parade. So, uh, yeah, he had to run the whole thing. Not good. Some, some story. Um, Another thing I wanted to ask about, of course, and, you know, it is detail in the book. And I, I'm conscious, obviously, of the fact that your book is about telling stories and experiences with, with the drivers involved. And mm -hmm. um, you would probably hate the fact that I'm asking you so many questions about you. But you know what? You're here. I'm going to ask them anyway, right? <laughs> but it goes back to the whole thing of, you know, working hard, getting your, you know, moving up the line, we'll say. So, like, you were, you were a PA for F1 management while you, were, while you were still studying. And there was an opportunist in you that uh you know may have saw a few interviews floating about you availed of those opportunities and obviously while taking a bit of a risk there it's got to have stood to you um yeah. going forward but i was still like would would it have came as a surprise to you that it was 2008 then before that kind of big break will say such came about in terms of f1 am i unfair in suggesting that yeah, because you've got to earn. I mean, it doesn't really happen now. You get people turning up in the F1 paddock who just aren't good enough to be there. But, um, you know, I had covered uh, Champ Car, A1 GP, F3000, GP2. That's why I think I'm good at what I do now, because I actually went up the, the ladder. Um, I did all the prep, tends, the whole way up a lot. did all the prep. You can tell the people a mile off who have taken a route like that. Um, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, but, you know, I didn't ever want to be on TV. I wanted to do this job and I wanted to do it well. I didn't expect to do it on television. I was writing from the age of 15. I used to get a Monday morning off school. I used to cover rugby on a Saturday and then go into my local newspaper and write up the rugby report on a Monday morning and do a horse column called Horsing Around with Lee, Lee McKenzie. And um, that's what I knew. At that time, I was only going to do rugby or only going to do horses. And then the, F the motorsport thing was in the background. I loved it, but I wasn't quite sure how I could get there. Um, and then just uh, I sort of started looking into it a bit more. Paths opened up and I, I, I just worked my way up. Hmm. Lee, what does a normal day look like for you? Because obviously you are so busy. You're involved in broadcasting and so many sports. Um, <laughs> I, I'm kind of strange in the sense that I, I can't really turn away from sport. I look at sport in my downtime. I just don't get away from it. I just live and breathe it. Is there something that Lee McKenzie does to try and maybe get away from everything? Yeah, I'm quite bad for that as well. And somebody did say to me last year, you cannot sit on your days off. And particularly when I was doing Champions Cup rugby and things, it's like you cannot just try and watch 11 rugby matches. You know, it's like you're going to lose your life if you if you do this. Just concentrate on what you need to do. Um, I, I just go outside. I go, I've got horses. Uh, I go riding. I go into nature. It sounds a bit like, you know, cliche or dull, but th that's what I love to do. I just love to get away from it. What I do in Formula One is a world removed from what I am away from Formula One. Uh, and I just, if I can spend any time with, you know, the horses, go out riding, do that kind of thing, that's, that's always what I'll do. Yeah, yeah. Just bring it back to neutral, whatever it yeah. takes. And, that's, and also that's animals good. don't judge. They'd have a, no clue if you're tired, jet lagged, if you've written a book or if you've just, you know, like, yeah. you know, got out of bed. They, they don't care. It takes a bit of time to master that, though, as well, to, to actually find what does kind of yeah. stabilize you, doesn't it? 
Yeah, and it doesn't always work, to be perfectly honest. You know, sometimes uh, you're just constantly wired <laughs> and other times you sort of can really ease off. And I think it's important to at least try or at least know how you can do it. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of stories I kind of just want to delve into. Um, I, I know we, we don't want to give away the entire book, right? <laughs> so I have limited to kind of just one one per driver. But um, okay. I'll start with the, with, with the poignant moment with, with Michael Schumacher when you walk down alongside him in Brazil, knowing that that was mm -hmm. probably it. I mean, such a surreal moment, such a special one as well. Yeah, it was really special. I couldn't believe that Michael had come back into Formula One for me to get the chance to work with him. Um, and then I was there in Brazil. I saw him jump over the wall, the pit lane, and the grid in Brazil is very different. It's on a hill, um, and you really do have to sort of like either come up steps or climb over a wall. And I saw him popping up. And I just uh, always wave my mic. I don't just storm up to someone. I gave him the opportunity to say no, and he beckoned me over. And I did the the last walk with Michael from the uh, car up through the garages um, in the pit lane. Someone happened to take a photo of of me. It's on my wall actually in the office. It's just one of those moments where, actually, for you know, Brazil had tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people there. Um, but in this picture, it's just myself and Michael. It was like the world had stopped round about, and and that was really a really special moment for his last ever Grand Prix. Yeah, absolutely class indeed. Um, a lot of people would give anything to to have that. To, to be honest with you, you know what I mean. Um, I'll move on to Lewis Hamilton. Like, there's there's a lot actually on, on Lewis Hamilton here, but I suppose the mad ending to 08 is a standout. But the one I wanted to get into, and obviously being the Irish F1 show, there's an Irish connection. When Eddie Jordan, you know, had kind of broke the story about. Lewis going to Mercedes. It wasn't, uh, I suppose, to be, I suppose, common knowledge. Um, he no. was obviously very well tipped off, and uh, it was a big gamble to take, I suppose, to break it, was it? Yeah, and Eddie is a great, great friend of mine, but there's a lot of chaos that goes with EJ. And when he came out with this, we were a bit like, what, what is, what did you mean? So this was in, in, um, Monza in Italy and he said I know it we need to say it now the BBC's policy is you've got to have two sources um, and we were looking around and we couldn't really ask anyone and Eddie was because of his connections to everyone and he's always still been doing deals in the background and helping drivers move around and was you know obviously very close with Bernie um, and EJ was adamant and in the end we broke the story and everyone hated us M M McLaren were furious uh, like absolutely furious because they thought that they had Lewis and Mercedes were furious because what it meant was that if Lewis was going there, then either Lewis or Nico were going to have to leave the team. Um, so, yeah, I think that just uh, everyone just couldn't believe it. It just seemed so far fetched at that time because there, other, there had been other teams mentioned, but Mercedes was never one of those teams. It was a Red Bull or Ferrari or whatever, mm. but never Mercedes. So, uh, yeah, EJ, he, he dines out in it still and quite rightly so. Yeah, didn't turn out too bad for Lewis either, in fairness. Yeah. <laughs> Your relationship with Sebastian Vettel, it's it's a very special one, right? And a lot of YouTube videos have gone viral. And there's that, I suppose, you can interpret it as cheeky teenage schoolboy approach where, uh, you know, he might say something that you could interpret as being borderline flirtatious. And for me, I take that in very good fun. You seem to take it in very good fun as well. Um, is, is that how it is, yeah? Yeah, because when you know somebody away from the cameras as well, it means that when the cameras are on, it just becomes a bit of a, you know, it's an open season. Um, we have done, I always say this to people, but nobody ever remembers them. But we, ha we have done some really good, big, important interviews. Yeah. But people yeah. remember the ones where he gave out my phone number or, you know, <laughs> going on about a red dress. And there never was a red dress. But he knows exactly what he's doing. He loves a bit of chaos, especially, at, you know, when he was winning day in, day out. He had to find something to sort of give himself a little sort of bit of amusement. Otherwise, you're asking the same questions every single day. You're answering the same questions every single day. So that's mm. really when it started um but yeah we get on great you know we, i get on great with his family as well it's it's lovely to see them and he will be sorely missed yeah if that's if that's someone else that you don't know and i think unfortunately in society today people don't know how to read the room a lot of the time right and you might see something on social media about this the next thing is like how dare he and all that 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 kind of troubles me a little bit and i think in the last couple of years since covid that's something that has really raised and reared its ugly head at times um yeah. would that would that be a particular frustration for you or or would you go along with that like maybe if that was said just say now um would that be interpreted differently do you think 
I don't know. People have mentioned it before, and I've always gone back and said to them, you've got to understand. If I was uncomfortable with something, that's for me to say. That's not for yeah. other people to judge. I think that's the same in all walks of life. Um, you've got to know the person 100%. I mean, uh, as I say, if it was happening day in, day out in rugby, that would be maybe a little bit different. Uh, but again, you've got to know the the, the individual person and um, and judge it on that. Simple as that. Uh, moving along very quickly, because I know we're getting tight on time. Max Verstappen outwardly seems so intense. We've seen videos behind the scenes where he yeah. is such good fun then as well. But what's your experience has been like with him? Uh, I mean, he's intense. When the first time I ever met him, he told me his life goal had, at the age of seven was to become a world champion. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I knew what a life goal was at the age of seven. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's just extraordinary. He has been he's like a hothouse flower he's just been primed and prepped and and ready for this it seems for all his life um and you can see it this year you know he has been incredible this year people you know have a, an issue about red bull as they did when seb was winning um but i don't really think you can take away from max and what he's achieved this year and how he's outperformed checo sergio perez and just dragged every thousandth of a second out of that car mm -hmm. Uh, Alonso, we've touched upon the uh, the actor question a little bit, yeah. but maybe a word on him. Yeah, Fernando's great. I mean, uh, the, I get frustrated with Fernando. Um, he's eight points away from being a five-time world champion. There's nothing wrong with being a two-time world champion. You know, very few people leave with that accolade. But uh, he's just managed to put himself in the wrong place so many different times over the years. Uh, I really like him. I think he's so clever. I think he reads the race incredibly well. He drags an underperforming car around the track on so many occasions. Um, but yeah, I've got a lot of time for Fernando. It's great that he's still staying because we need people like him that cause a bit of anarchy, but also just of the class just almost cover it over. Yeah. If he was in a Red Bull, would he be still winning races? Because um, the guys that do the podcast with me are convinced that he still has the capability to win races given the right car. Oh, I absolutely think so. I mean, you could mm. even see it on uh, Sunday. That was his 350th Grand Prix and the Alpine let him down. Now, I'm not saying he would have won that race, although Esteban won a, in an Alpine last year. Um, but he he is not going to... Like they, there's this thing with age that you're going to like lose your skills, lose your talents, your reaction time, all the rest of it. Fernando started at such a high level that if he does lose any of that, it might bring him back down. But I just really wish and hope he has a car to do him justice. But then we've been saying that since 2006 onwards. Felipe Massa encapsulates that Brazilian charisma. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great. I mean, Felipe is just a, a family man, a hugely talented driver, probably didn't get the credit he deserved, um, remembered for two major moments, really, uh, not winning a championship when he thought he had done, and a life-changing crash um, in Hungary. And uh, But he was such a lovely person to have around, uh, just a, a really joyous person that it particularly sort of encap encapsulates that brazilian attitude where you know you give them three passes to get into somewhere and they bring 15 people and you never know how that's happened whether it be a party or the paddock or whatever uh but great fun to have around and um yeah it, he, he's he's still in the paddock he was there at the weekend he's doing yeah. japan actually for channel four uh for us in japan this weekend as well so um yeah he, he's he's a little sort of ball of energy last but not least jensen Bowden, obviously you know, product of the the Braun project, uh, which uh, worked out particularly well, and then went on to become obviously a very good colleague of yours too. Yeah, Jensen. Well, it's a bit like Anchorman because he's on Sky, so we kind of shout across at each other, like waving our microphones. But I did interview him a couple of weeks ago at uh, Goodwood Revival, and I did say to him, I thought these days were over. He was sitting in his car, I was sticking a mic in his face, um, and it was great fun. He's a lovely person, so. Um, similar to what he was when he started really you know yes he's got a lot more money he's uh, got a lot more accolades but in terms of being a really wholesome great person as well as a great driver still to this day in fact um he, he's just sort of he's the guy you would see and have a drink with in a pub you know he's just so normal and yet he's not two last questions the last one is going to be where's the book available and the second last one try to survive fans that have become experts in the last couple of years how does that sit with you well, Drive to Survive has done a vast amount for Formula One. Um, mostly you can't get in or can't get out of the car park now because there's 400,000 people trying to do that as well. We've all been given a bit of a shock because we had nobody there during the COVID times. Now we're all like, well, we've got a queue to go in. Um, 
it's it's huge. The thing why I actually wanted to do this book really was if you just watch Drive to Survive, you think it started when Lando Norris turned up, or you don't really understand why it would be an incredible, ex amazing moment if Fernando Alonso won this year or. Sebastian Vettel got a podium this year because you've got to know what they've been through. These are guys who achieved so much early on. You don't get that backstory in Drive to Survive. I think it's great for the popularity, but I also know a lot of people that watch Drive to Survive that still don't watch Formula One. So it's been a really interesting uh, sort of social experiment in many ways. Um, yeah, if, if you like that, I think people who are in the sport don't always see it as real life. I know Max Verstappen doesn't do it and, and not all the drivers are 100% convinced at the moment because it becomes a little bit like reality TV, but it has been incredibly good for Formula One. Mm -hmm. Inside F1 is out today, the 5th of October. Where is it available? Well, hopefully everywhere, but that might uh, I'm pretty sure that's not true. Um, you can get it in supermarkets, bookshops. There's an audio version, which David Coulthard reads the start of, and then I read the rest. So you've got two um, sort of cynical Scottish people droning on for about eight hours. You've got a hardback <laughs> and you have a Kindle edition as well. So I'm sure anyone can find it. Just go onto my socials or I'm sure on your socials as well, and it'll be there lurking around. Good stuff. Lee McKenzie, an absolute pleasure to speak to you on the Irish F1 show. Thanks a million. The best look at the book. Thank you so much. It's been great.